Okay. I hope the recording has started. It seems like it. Okay, so welcome to another session where today we're going to continue. Uh, we looked at study unit. Study unit one, two, and three. We did the revision on that. So today we're going to look at study unit four and five, and we'll see how far we get with answering the questions. Huh? Um, for every bit of the study unit, I'm I'm tempted to to do a recap on some of the concepts that you need to to remember when you go and answer the questions. But I also am tempted not to because it it will save us a lot of time. Uh, so we will we will do the recap as we look at the questions, so that then it makes it easy for us to continue as quickly as possible. Um, today, since we also need to use study unit five, we we will have to have the tables. So I hope. You would have downloaded the tables and have them ready some way. Um, tables are part of the um, the notes that I've shared as well, so everybody should have the same table because we're gonna use the we're gonna work through the same tables. So study unit four talks about basic probabilities. You need to always remember with basic probabilities how to define it. Um, you need to also remember how to define what is a simple probability or a simple event, uh, what is a joint event, what is a complement of an event. Uh, you need to know the basic properties in terms of uh, probabilities that the sum of all probabilities are equals to one. You need to know the addition rule um, and you need to know the uh, multiplication rule, you need to know your conditional probabilities. And also, not only that, you need to know that probabilities, you can summarize them in terms of a Venn diagram or a cross tabulation or a decision tree. You need to know all those as well. You also need to know about mutually exclusive events, exhaustive events, and so on. But on top of all the probabilities that we deal with, you also need to know the counting rules because they are also part of the section where we deal with probabilities as well. So you need to know your counting rule, your factorial uh, combination, permutation, and the multiplication rule and how to calculate each and every one of them and identify when you read the question, when is it a factorial, when is it a multiplication, when a multiplication rule, and when it is a combination or a permutation, where a permutation, um, uh, clearly there is uh, an order and combination, there is no order, things like that. You need to know all those how to define each and every one of them. And that is study unit. We will talk about study unit five later on. Uh, and you need to know that probabilities are always between zero and one. So therefore it means if it's a decimal, it is a probability. If it's a whole number, it is an event that you can use to calculate the probabilities. All right, I hope those are the things that makes it easy for you to identify as you read the question. So I expect you to have already went through study unit four, and then we can answer the questions. Okay, so the first question on here, it talks about the counting rules, and that's what I was talking about when I said you need to, um, to always remember the counting rules and know uh, how to define also the probabilities. Okay, so let's answer these questions and remind ourselves of what we need to always know. 
which one of the following statement is correct with regards to experiments, counting rules, and assigning of probabilities? A, an experiment described by a sequence of four steps with three outcomes possible for each step one and step two, four outcomes possible for step three, and two outcomes possible for step four, will have a total of 24 outcomes. So you need to be able to look at that question and ask yourself, when I'm given these outcomes and they are telling me that there are four steps and each step has some outcomes out of it, what is it? Is it a factorial? Is it a multiplication? Is it a combination or is it a permutation? Or is it probability question? So you need to know which one to use on there. Which formula to use it as well, remember? Factorial, it will be n factorial. Multiplication, it will be m times n, depending if there are five. So it will be m, m times n times p. If there, sorry, if there are three, it will be like that, and so on. And then combination, remember? Mm. The formula for combination it will be NCR, and for permutation, it will be NPR. You need to be able to identify which one of them to apply on these questions. Number B, the number of combinations of six items that can be selected from a group of eight items is number C, the number of permutation of five items that can be selected from a group of eight is. And in an experiment with six equal, equally likely outcomes, each uh, experimental outcome has a probability of, mm, and that is what we call um, uh, assigning probabilities, we know that when we assign a probability, an experiment will have the observation satisfying that event divided by the number of uh, uh, the total outcome or the sample space. And that is the formula that you will use when you assign probabilities. So you will need to know how to uh, calculate that. A relative frequency method of assigning probability is appropriate when the data is available to estimate the proportion of the time the outcome will occur if the experiment is repeated a large number of times. And here it's more about the definition. Is this a definition of an experiment, a definition of an observational experiment or some sort? So let's get to the question, which one of this is correct? So number A, um, which formula are we gonna use? Is it the factorial, the multiplication, combination or permutation? And if, when you choose which formula to use, please remember to tell me the answer as well on how to be calculated. Number A, how do we answer A? Nobody, no one. Nada, next. Is it going to be a factorial? A factorial is if they have given you one, one value, let's say, in a race, there are seven positions. How many number of ways can I win a, a position or can I get a medal in a, in a race? So if only seven people are getting a, a medal out of the whole race, there are seven positions that gets awarded the medal. How many number of ways can I get a medal? That is if you want to use factorial because then you say it's seven factorial, that for it will say it's seven times six times five times four times three times two times one will give you the answer. Or you can use your calculator to calculate seven factorial where 
on your sharp calculator, it will have an N with an exclamation mark. When you are using a casio, it will have an X with an exclamation mark. That is the function that we will use. So with this question, because they had given us four steps with three outcomes, then we're going to use a multiplication rule because we're going to say it will be, they say for um, with three outcome, possible outcome for step one and step two. So step one has three outcomes, step two has three outcomes, and step four has, step three has four outcomes, and step four has two outcomes. So we're going to take only the number of outcomes and multiply them. So step one and two, they said they've got three outcomes. So it's three times three times four times two. What is the answer? Uh, am I alone today? <laughs> the answer is seventy. Seventy-two. Seventy-two, which makes this is incorrect because they said the total is twenty-four. Moving to B, B says the number of combinations. So already with B, they have given you a hint in terms of which formula you will have to use. You will use a combination. A number of combination of six items that can be selected from eight groups. Always remember the bigger number will be equivalent to your sample space, which will, will be your N, and the smaller number will be your R or your X. So therefore, it means for this question, you will answer it by using your N is 8 combination and your R will be 6. And if you didn't know, do you know how to use your calculator to calculate combination? Which is the shortcut. I just want to stop sharing. Let's go to next one. I want to talk in between. And okay, so I only have at the moment open. Um, I have, I have my sharp calculator open. So those who have a Casio calculator, you will have to look at your Casio. You will press. Um, I'll tell you when where is the on the Casio calculator. Your combination function it's on the division side on your Casio calculator. So let's first do deal with the sharp. Uh, since I have it here open, so for a sharp calculator, your combination is on button number five. Uh, those who have a sharp calculator or the uh, financial ca sharp calculator it will almost be on the same uh, function. So because it's written in orange, we're going to use the second function. Uh, for those who are using a Casio, you will use the shift. So we first press the N, which is the value that we put first, which is eight. So you say eight and you go second function and you press the NCR and you press six and you press equal and that will give you the answer of 28 and they said it is 20,000 so it means that is not correct Let me know if you don't know how to use your calculator. It's very important that you know how to use your calculator. So do number C. I'm not going to calculate it for you. 
So it is permutation. So the formula for permutation is that. So it's NPR. So also do likewise and calculate and tell me what is the answer that you get. Uh, so busy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry to disturb. My calculator is giving me an error one. Uh, what calculator are you using? I'm using a sharp um, EL531WH, the advanced DAL. The old one. Yeah, so do you do you have um, NCR? Are you able to see where your NCR is? Uh, which number is it? N, it's a function, NCR. Yeah, number eight, yes. It's number? Eight. And what color is it written in? Is it written in orange? Or yeah. is it? Okay. It's orange and then on the right hand side there's an SX. Okay, no, it's fine. Um, so press eight and then press the orange button on your calculator, which I'm going to assume it's second function. Yeah. So you will press second function. Yes. And then you will press that button that says NCR. You will press the function. Whatever you see that NCR and then press six and then press equal. Okay, there's something. Let me try and insert it back to that mode because. Uh, no, it should not be in that mode. It should be in your normal mode. So take your calculator back to normal mode. If it's in that mode, you need to take it back to normal mode to normal. So you press, you press mode zero, and zero. it will go back to normal mode, and you follow the same steps as I have shown you. Okay, let me not take time for everyone. Let me try and figure it out. Um, do you have the NPR? Yeah, NPR is number nine. Okay, so you do the same with NPR. So in, for this one, it will be eight. eight. Second function. And okay. then you will press the function that has the NPR. And then you will press, it says five. So this one will be five. And then you press equal. Do you guys have the say the answer for number C? It gave me six seven two zero. Oh. Zero. Oh. Six seven two zero. Six seven two zero. So oh. which means this is incorrect. So the answer should be six thousand seven hundred and twenty. Are we all winning? Okay. On a cashier, the buttons are a multi multiply and a divide. So they're just below the delete button and the AC. Yes. Yes. On a cashier, it's on the NCR, it's on the uh, it's under the divide, on the button divide, and the NPR is on the multiplication, and you use the shift instead of second function. So So for those um, who are using a Casio, you will press, for the first one, you will press eight, and you will say second function. Uh-uh, not second shift. function, shift. shift. You will shift. say shift, shift because mm -hmm. we're using a Casio. Yeah. You will say shift, and you will press the division button, and then you will press six, and it should give you 28. For the second one, you will say eight shift 
and you will press the multiplication button and you will press five and the answer should be six, seven, two, zero. Um, Lizzie, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. How do you know out of the two um, numbers, which one comes first? So the you've got six one. items. And, oh, is first. it always the bigger one first? Yeah, the, remember the big one needs to be N. N is big. R or X is small. So the bigger one. So you'll always remember that the bigger one between the two, you look at the bigger one, it will be your N. Okay. Okay. I see so that. D. Okay. Yeah. And then D. In an event with six equally outcomes, each experimental outcome has a probability of 0 0.14. Now, if there are six and say the, uh, the uh, outcome has the same probability, therefore, it means we're going to use the probability function to calculate. So we know that there are six outcomes. So outcome one, outcome two, outcome three, outcome four, outcome five, outcome six, irregardless of what they have. So these are the outcome of this sample space. To calculate what is the probability of getting a one, it's x over n. Calculate the probability of getting a 2. It's x over n. Calculate the probability of getting a 3. It's x over n. So there is only one outcome that you count, right? So therefore, it will be 1 over 6 for every one of them. Calculating the probability that an outcome comes out from a 3 will be 1 because there is only one 3. For a 4, it will be 1. For a 5, it will be 1. For a 6, it will be 1. So it will always be 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6. Hence, they say, in this mm -hmm. experiment with six equally likely outcomes, each experiment will have the probability of this. So what will be the outcome of this likely experiment? 1 over 6, which is equals to... Zero comma zero six one one six or one seven one seven. So which means that is also incorrect. The last one it says it it just gives you a definition of the experiment anyway because an experiment is a relative frequency method of assigning probabilities when a data is available to estimate the proportion because when we when we calculate probabilities pro, remember probabilities are like your proportion because the proportion of selecting a value of two is one over six which is zero comma one seven that's a proportion estimating a proportion of the time of the outcome will occur if the experiment is repeated and if this gets repeated over a time you can also calculate those proportion or probabilities so this is just a definition of experiment so you need to go and read how do you define what an experiment is what is an observer what the types different um, types of um, probabilities you get uh, what is the, an event? What is an outcome? All those things, you need to know them because they can be asked in the exam as one of the options. So the only correct answer here is E. Moving on. To the next question. Consider an experiment with four outcomes with associated probabilities, the probability of event one, probability of event two, probability of event three, and probability of event four. Which one of the following outcome 
does not meet the basic requirement of assigning probabilities. Now, no. you need to think carefully when you look at this. Ask yourself this question, knowing the basic concepts of probabilities, what is the most important thing that you always need to remember and, and validate? If you have different probabilities, the sum of all probabilities should be equals to? That's your question. One. The sum of all probabilities should be equals to one. one. Now, looking at this, they are asking you to do that. Just act. So it means the sum of all these probabilities, because it says consider the experiment with four outcomes with associated probabilities, which one of the following outcome does not meet the basic requirement of assigning probabilities? You can do the addition, the top, let's start with A. A, how, man, how many probabilities? So the sum of all those probabilities are equals to? One. Are they all equals to one? So the sum, is, the sum of all these probabilities is equals to one. And the second one? It is equals to one. It's also equals to one. What are they trying to get to? On this because all of them are equals to one. Oh, because we're looking for the one that does not respond. Mm. Okay, right. My bet. And number C? Equals to one. It's equals mm. to one. So the sum of all probabilities is equals to one. Number D? 0 0.8. Exactly. The sum of all probabilities is equals to 0 0.8. 8. And number E? 1. The sum of all probabilities eight. is equals to 1. Is equals to 1. So which one of this is incorrect? Number D. Number D. <laughs> number D. Okay. Um, question three, consider two events, A and B, and they say the probability of getting an event A is 0 0.55, the probability of getting event B is 0 0.22, and the probability of A and B is 0 0.11. Which one of the following statement is correct? So we're looking for the correct statement. Now we need to validate each and every statement. All right? So we start with statement number A. What do we know about mutually exclusive events? If event A and B are mutually exclusive, the probability of their joint event a and B will be zero. zero will be equals to zero. From the statement that they have given us in the beginning, are they equals to zero? No. No. Not. no. no. So therefore, that is not correct. Therefore, it means event A and B are not mutually exclusive. Remember? The tricky part here is to trick you in terms of you not knowing what to do with the statement. You just need to remember the basic concepts that you know and validate or confirm if that statement is true or not. So we know that from the given statement, the probability of A and B, which is the joint probability of A and B is 0 0.11. Therefore, they are not mutually exclusive. So it's incorrect. Number B, if event A and B are independent, then the probability of B 
given A is 0, 0,5 size. If they have given you the probability of B given A, you can calculate that to validate, right? Because they also say if event A and B are independent, when event A and B are independent, what do we know? We know the following, right? If A and B are independent, the probability of A given B will be given by the probability of A because they are independent. B has no bearing on what happened to A. Given that it happened, it doesn't have any bearing on what is happening to the probability of A or to the event A. Oh. Because we know that the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. And this is part of the notes, <laughs> what we discussed, right? <laughs> if you know this, for oh. independent events, the conditional probability of the probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A. The probability of B given A is equal to B. That is if event A and B are independent. So now, let's go there and check. They are saying, if event A and B are independent, then the conditional probability of B given A should be equals to 0, 0.55. Is that true? Let's go back to the statements given. What is the probability of B? 0 0.22. From mm. what we know in terms of the independence of events, we know that the conditional probability of B given A is the same as the probability of B. So, that is not correct, right? Because the probability of B is 0 0.22. And that is incorrect. So you, with basic probabilities, you need to know your probabilities. Now, when you go write the exam, it's easy because I uh, don't want to say this because these things are recorded, right? We can discuss that after. But uh, it's easy to remember all this because it's part of your notes. You get me. All these things are in your study guide. There is a decision tree in your study guide that explains all this nicely. And it tells you for independent event, they give you those things. So if you can have next to uh, summary notes and practice with those summary notes in the exam, it will make it easy for reference because you will remember that because you would have seen it somewhere before. It will help you, right? Can have a discussion offline. Okay, so <laughs> maybe you do understand what I'm trying to tell you here because some of the things I can't say them online when it's a recorded session like this these things they get watched by very important people <laughs> and so let's move on to c c says the probability of a or b is equals to 0 0.66 so this is what we call an addition an addition rule what do we know about the addition rule this is what we know. The probability of A or B, or we can use this function. So if you don't know how to write it, or it's union. Remember that, right? Hence, I'm, I'm interchanging with symbols. Or is the same as union. So is the same as the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. You were given all the values. All what you need to do is substitute into the formula, calculate, and check if that is correct. 
Let's do that. What is the probability of A? It's 0 0.55 because everything is given to you in the statement. Go back to the statement with the probabilities. Plus, what is the probability of B? 0 0.22 minus. What is the probability of A and B? 0 0.11. Calculate. What is the answer? It's 0 0.66. It's 0,66. Therefore, it means C is correct. In the exam, you will stop right there and move on to the next question. Number D. D says, if A complement is the complement of A, then the probability of A complement is equals to? What is the complement of A? What is the probability of A complement? It's one minus the probability of A, right? So what is the probability of A? One minus 0 0.55, and that is equals to 0 0.45. And G will be incorrect. And that's how you will validate the questions and find out whether they are correct, the statement that they have given you. Since I've done A, do B, do E. What is the probability of B complement? I think it's one minus 0 0.22. It will be 1 minus the probability of B, which is 1 minus 0 0.22. And the answer is 0 0.78, which makes this incorrect. That's easy, right? May you please not move from this slide for just one minute? A few seconds. You will let me know when you want me to move. This is. And that you Thank must you, the lying one. You Thank you. All right. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Given the table there, they've given us, right? The World Health Organization notes that gender identity is a social construct that varies across culture. The contingency table above shows a combination of probabilities from different gender identities and how each group generally feel marginalized within their spaces. Which one of the following statement is correct? We are looking for the correct statement based on this. So looking at this table, like I said in the beginning when I was introducing this, how do we identify whether we are given events or are we given probabilities? So based on this table that we have, are these probabilities or are these events? Probabilities. Because these are probabilities because there is different ways of calculating probabilities if you are given events and when you are given probabilities. So if these are probabilities and we have made that observation now, these are probabilities. So if we know that these are probabilities, there is not, no need for us to go and calculate the probability using 
the probability of an event is the same as x over n, or the probability of a joint event is x over the sample space, n total. We don't have to because these are probabilities already. These are calculated. So mm -hmm. we just use them in the formulas and we just use them to answer the question. So mm -hmm. now looking at the table, question number option A, it says event non-binary and low are mutually exclusive. Non-binary and low are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? What they are saying is the probability yes. of non-binary and low for it to be mutually exclusive, it means they are equals to zero. The probability yes. of both are equals to zero. So number A will be correct yes. because the probability of low and non-binary is equals to zero. The event non-binary and low are independent of each other. How do we validate that? Let's assume that A was, was not correct. Then we move on to B. How do we validate that non-binary and low are independent? We just did that, right? Mm -hmm. In the previous question, we spoke about this the conditional probabilities. So let's check that. We need to find out whether, because they say they are independent of each other. What we need to find out is that the probability of non-binary given, given low should be equals to the probability of non-binary. That's what we, we need to prove. We know what is the probability of non-binary? The probability of non-binary is the sum of all these values. You add all of them. Because on this table, you need to have total. On the total, you get simple probabilities. So 0 and 0 plus 0 0.3 is the same as 0 0.03. That's what we have, 0 0.03. Now we need to find out if this site is the same as that site. How do we find that out? We need to use the conditional probabilities. We know that for conditional probabilities, let's write the formula. The probability of A given B, conditional probability it says is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. That is the formula that we're using. So since we have N and L, we're going to find the probability of N and L divided by the probability of L. So what is the probability of N and L is zero? Mm -hmm. It is zero. What is the probability of L? The probability of L is 0 0.76 because we need to also add the total here. 0 0.76 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 is 0 0.76. Therefore, this is equals to 0 because any number, 0 divided by any number, it will stay 0. So what we do here is that the probability of n divided L is not equals to the probability of n. So therefore, Sorry. they are not independent because if they were equal, they would be independent. We know that if they are equal, they are in the independent. I don't know how to write independent. I hope that is the the way to write independent. So we've established that this side is equals to zero because zero divided by 0 0.6 is zero. 
and probability of n 0 comma 0 3 so they are not equal so they are not independent c how do we answer c the probability that a randomly selected person identifies as binary or feels high level of b marginalized is 0 0.3 Zero 03. So here they want you to calculate the probability of non binary or high, which is the same as the probability of non binary plus the probability of high minus the probability of joint non binary and, and high. And because of this, or you will have to use this formula, which is the same formula as we used previously. The probability of A or B, same as the probability of non-binary or high, it's given by the probability of non-binary plus the probability of high minus the probability of non-binary and high. So let's find the values. Um, for high, so I can just add all of these values, calculating the total. This will be 6, 4, it will be 10, 0 0.10, 0 0.14, 0 0.14. And the probability non binary, we already calculated the total. And the joint of non binary and high is is 0 0.3 so we'll use those three values to calculate so let's go we have the probability of non-binary which is 0 0.03 plus the probability of high which is 0 0.14 14 minus the probability of a joint of non-binary and high, which is 0 0.03. And what is the answer? The answer will be 0 0.14. And therefore, this will be incorrect. And that's how you will validate that question, right? Let's see how we answer D. You must let me know if you are still getting confused. All right. Okay. Yeah, can you please go to D? Who? Okay. No, okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you can move yeah. on. D? How do we validate D? D says the probability that a randomly selected person identifies as cisgender. Then it means simple probability cisgender, which means we need to calculate the total. That's where we will find the probability cisgender. The probability cisgender will be given here. So by adding 0 0.76 plus 0 0.7 plus 0 0.3. What is the answer? 0 0.86. 86. So that will be 0 0.86. Therefore, D is incorrect. Because this gender is on its own, then it means it is a simple probability. Remember, on a contingency table, inside here, these are joint probabilities, the totals are your simple probabilities or what we call marginal probabilities. Okay, let's look at E. Oh, why am I crossing out E? E, the probability that a randomly selected person feels high level, which is the same as simple probability of high level, so that will be the probability of high. What is the probability of high? We calculated the total is 0, 0,14. 0, and that is not the same as 0, 0,1. And 
and that is incorrect. And that's how you will validate this. For moderate, you just add all of them. That will be 0, 0,10. For other, it's 0, 0,06. For transgender, 0, 0,05. Add the total. The sum of all values should always be equals to 1. That is if I need to complete the entire contingency table. Easy, ne? So can I please ask, is it wise to always um, complete the contingency table first before answering the questions? Or you can just just answer the questions without even. You you can like we did. We. We completed what we wanted to complete at that point, right? Yes. Uh, the other thing is in the exam, you're writing against time. Mm. Spending time doing other things that are irrelevant to the question might take you longer. So mm. in the exam, minimize your time. Take shortcuts. Um, take your okay. time. It's up to you, but make sure that you look at the time like right now, literally. We we are on question four and it's eight o'clock. So it means we took almost if if we say we started at quarter past, we took almost 45 minutes answering four mm -hmm. questions. In the exam, you don't have that luxury because mm -hmm. you're writing out of two hours, 45 minutes, four questions out of 25 questions or 15 questions. You're not gonna make it. So minimize the think about it. If you know that you're going to work quicker, you can write the totals quickly. But the other thing is you are writing online, so you you might not have the luxury to do that because it means you would have you would want to copy this table again on the piece of paper and write the values again and which won't help you that much. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK. Looking at the same table, I'm not going to complete all the values because we have them. Hence, I've completed them here. So we'll toggle between the two to find the values if need if need needed. Given that a randomly selected individual identi identifies as transgender, what is the probability that they feel a moderate level of being marginalized? That is... You need to calculate the probability of moderate given that the person is a transgender. So since we have the question, we need to calculate it based on the conditional probability of moderate and transgender divided by transgender. What is the joint probability of moderate and transgender? Uh, moderate is 10, isn't it? No. What is the, the probability of a joint probability of moderate and transgender? No, sorry. <laughs> it's 0 0.01. 0 .01. It will be 0. 0.01. 0. 0, 1. And what is the probability of transgender? Is just adding all these probabilities, which is 0, 0,05. Mm -hmm. And that is 0, 0,05. Calculate and tell me what is the answer. Zero comma zero two. Zero point two. It's option A. 
Okay. Now we're moving into discrete probabilities. Remember now, with discrete probabilities, there are two things or three things that you need to always constantly remember, right? Um, the discrete probabilities, you will be given a table or you might be given a table with the X values and the corresponding probabilities. You need to know how to define what a discrete probability is. You need to know what are the properties of a discrete probability and so on. You also need to know how to calculate the values or the probabilities. And remember the sign and the language. Remember, what does this mean? Or what does this, what does this mean? At least when I you know, when I'm referring to at least or when I'm referring to at most. What does that mean? Right? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this refer to? Right? You need to be able to know these things, especially when you work with probabilities, discrete probabilities. Okay, so. This question is asking, oh, you need to also know the formula to calculate discrete probabilities, um, the expected value, the mean, uh, which is the mean, the expected value, which is the mean of discrete probability. You need to know how to calculate the, uh, the standard deviation and the variance. Okay, so. What is the expected value of a discrete probability with n of eight equally outcomes? There are multiple ways of doing this, and there is the other simple ways of doing this. Because there are eight of them, so remember the expected value, which is your expected value, of a discrete probability is the sum of all probability. The sum of your X observation multiplied by its corresponding probability. That is that. So you can either say, what is the probability of the, like, the, the equally likely good outcomes? In question one, we did this. So we said, the likely outcome, which is the probability of X for all outcomes will be one over eight for this because there are eight of them. So if there are eight observations, so it means we're going to say one times one over eight plus two times one over eight plus three times one over eight plus four times one over eight plus until we get to eight times one over eight. I'm not gonna do all of them. And that will give you your probability. Or the easy way, because they, are, they have the same outcome, we can take it out as a common factor. We can take out the sum of x, p, x, we know that the probability of X is a common factor. It's the same for all the values. We can take it out. It will be the probability of X times the sum of X. What does that mean? It means one over eight times one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven plus eight, use whichever method you feel comfortable with. They will give you the same, the same answer. So what is the answer? You can calculate one over eight is the same. Those who, who don't have the Casio calculator, you can, you can calculate this manually and say one divided by eight is, 0, 0,125. And then you can just put it into bracket. So you can just say,
you can just say zero comma one two five into bracket one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven plus eight close bracket and say equal and that will give you your answer of 4.5 right easy you can do it that way or if you want to follow the formula that we use say one times 0 0.125 close bracket plus which will take you forever two times 0.125 close bracket plus three times 0.125 close bracket plus four times 0.125 Close bracket plus five times point one two five. Close bracket plus six times point one two five. Close bracket plus seven times point one two five. Close bracket plus eight times. 0.125 close bracket equal 4.5 you still get the same answer save your time find the easiest way of doing things shorter methods or longer methods some of you might have templates from your your tutors that gives you um how to calculate these things on your excel or somewhere use that Okay, and that's how you will answer this question. Any questions? I know that I did it too quick, quick, quick on the calculator, but I guess you you get in, you understand what I'm trying to get at. There are two methods of answering this question. This will not work for other questions, especially if they have given you questions like this. Because there are different probabilities, it will not work with this method, the second method. It will only work with the first method because the probabilities are not constant for some. Only when they are constant, you can take it out as a factor and then calculate the rest. That's what we call factorization in math. Okay, so going on to question number seven. Consider the following discrete probabilities. Like I said, you will be given, it can either be horizontal or vertical. So it can be like this, X with its corresponding probabilities, or like this. It doesn't really matter how the table they have given you looks like. So sometimes they might give you X uh, not, not probabilities, but the frequencies or expect uh, or the count. Then you can use the frequency or the count to calculate your probabilities. It might work uh, like that, where they have given you the actual values, the actual events, and you need to calculate the probabilities. So here they give you your outcome and your probability. So your x versus your probability. The same question, calculate the expected value. So you need to calculate the expected value of this question. The sum of X observation times corresponding probabilities. You can just say the one multiply by 0, 0,3, that will be X times PX. That will be 0, 0,3. But we have a question mark. The question mark is the sum of all these values minus them from one that will give you what is the answer there. So one minus into bracket, if you like it, you can say one minus into bracket 0, 0.3 plus 
0.17 plus 0.17 plus 0.17 close bracket equal 0 0.19 and that is the answer here 0 0.19 and now multiply by 2 is 0 0.38 0.38 you can do it that way and the next one and seven multiply by three is 0 0.51 and the next one point one seven multiply by four is 0 0.68 And the next one, point one seven multiply by five is zero point eight five. If you add all of them, that will be your total, that will be your summation, and that will give you the answer. So what is the answer? I'm I must not do all the the activities for you. 2.72. Do we all agree? Yes. Yes. That uh, is 2.72. Uh, point, which is option number one. A. So can you please repeat them how you got that question mark? The question mark, you get it from one minus the sum of all the other values, 0 0.3, because the sum of all probabilities should be equals to one, 0 0.3 plus 0 0.17 plus 0 0.17 plus 0 0.17. You just use the open bracket, close bracket to get the answer. Otherwise, you can add all of them and then subtract them from one. Thank you. And let's see, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but if I add them all up, I get uh, 2.45. When you add which um, one now? And the last common column that you've there's some somewhere you miss one probably oh, okay yeah somewhere you've missed um, something Re uh, recalculate you know what i've done the first one i did 0 0.03 instead of 0 0.3 sorry yeah. my mistake okay thanks no worries okay Question eight, part of the discrete probability is there are two sections that you need to always know and always remember is the binomial and the Poisson. Both of them, you need to know that the properties of each, you need to know how to calculate the mean, which is the expected value, the standard deviation, and the variance. You also need to know how to calculate the probabilities if they ask you to calculate the probabilities. Now, with both binomial and discrete, no, binomial and Poisson, you need to use the table to calculate the probabilities. I hope you have the tables with you. Um, but we would use the table. We will need the table right now. Okay. Let's first answer this question and see if we will need the table. A building inspector would like to conduct an inspection of 13 randomly selected new building houses 
or new built houses to check whether or not they comply with the municipal regulation. The inspector knows from the past experience that eight out of 10 new built houses will comply with the municipal regulation. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? So we're looking for the incorrect statement. What is it that they have given us here? They told us that our N, which is our 13 randomly selected new built houses that they have checked. They also told us that eight out of 10, which is the probability of success or failure or whatever the one that they say, the inspector knows from the past experience that eight out of 10 house, um, eight out of every 10 new built houses will comply with the regulation. So it means they have given you the probability of success, which is equals to 8 divided by 10. And in terms of probabilities, which is in decimal form, 8 divided by 10 is equals to 0 0.5. 0 0.5. So since we have the probability of success, we have our sample size. Let's answer the question to find out which one is incorrect. You need to know the properties of a binomial. Uh, it has same trial, independent event or outcomes, two outcomes because it's binomial. Those are the properties, right? That you need to always constantly remember. They are two outcomes, probability of success or failure, and so on and so forth. So let's see. A, the experiment can be described as a binomial with 13 trials. Is that correct or incorrect? How many trials do we have? What is the N? That's are, it's 13, 13, right? So therefore this is correct. So we can, it's not incorrect, it is correct. So we move on. Two outcomes are possible for each trial, which there are two, two outcomes comply with the regulation success and doesn't comply with the regulation failure. Is that correct or incorrect? Correct. That is correct because it's binomial. It has two outcomes, it's a success and a failure. Number C, the probability that a newly developed house doesn't comply with the municipal Regulation is 0 0.8. Is that correct? What is a complement of a success? It's a failure, right? That question is asking you to calculate mm -hmm. the probability of a failure. Does not comply. If our success is 0 0.8, therefore the failure will be? 0 0.2. 0 0.2 because 0 0.8 minus or 1 minus 0 0.8 will be 0 0.2. So that is incorrect. That is the incorrect statement. What is the expected value of newly built houses? So you need to know how to calculate the expected value of a binomial probability. The expected value of a binomial probability is calculated by n multiplied by the probability of success. Your n is in your probability of success is 0 0.8. And what is the probability, the expected value, sorry. 13 times 0 0.8 is 10.4. Which means this is correct. Each inspection constitutes a trial with independent results. Is it true or false? 
So we know that it's binomial, they are independent, so that is correct. So those are the things that you need to, the properties that you need to remember and know about binomial. Okay. Next question. Consider the building inspector again and blah, blah, blah. Now they have built 18 new houses. So this is our N. Eight out of 10, which means our probability of success is still 0 0.8. But we have a new N. Our N here is 18. What is the probability that only five out of only five out of 18 built houses will comply with the municipal regulation. Now, looking at the options, it means we need to use the formula and not use the table. What is the probability? It's NCR because I'm going to use the shortcut. You've learned what, how to calculate NCR, right? I'm not going to use all those factorial divided by X times n minus x factorial, which this n c r is the same as n factorial divided by n times n minus x factorial, or is it x? I can't even remember one of the two, some something like that, but the formula don't know it by heart, so let's not let me not do that to myself. I remember the n c r. And this will be times the probability of x times 1 minus probability of n minus x. So we know that we need to calculate the probability of 5. Our n is 18, so it's 18. We are 5. Our probability here yeah, is 0. 8 to the power of x of 5 times 1 minus 0 0.8 to the power of 18 minus 5. So calculate NCR and tell me what is the answer. Just the NCR. It's 8,568, 8, 8, right? And we can eight. say multiply. We remove the bracket and put multiply by 0, 0,8 to the power of 5. Multiply by 1 minus 0. 8 is the same as 0 0.2 to the power of what is 18 minus 5? Uh, sorry, my sister, my apologies. There, where, where, where you say 0 0.8, is it not supposed to be 0 0.2 to the power 5? Where? But our probability um, of success is 0 0.8, right? Yes, yes. Yes. So 0 0.8 is our probability of success. 1 minus the probability of success is 0 0.2 because it's 1 minus 0 0.8 will be 0 0.2. What is 18 to the power? 18 minus 5 is 13. So look oh. for this answer. No, my apologies. No worries. We will blame it on half past 8. <laughs> Yeah. Which is option? Option one. Mm -hmm. Lizzy, could I please ask? Mm -hmm. the, um, the formula, the other formula you, you wrote on top there, is it the NC, NCX equals to N factorial divided by X fi, uh, factorial? And then open bracket n minus x close yes. bracket. 
Okay, I'm, I'm trying to use that formula on my calculator and it shows a... No, 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 code. no formula on the calculator. Mm -hmm. The only thing on your calculator you need to calculate is the NCR. You just need to calculate NCR, which oh. is 18. Okay. Oh. And five. What calculator are you using? I'm using a Casio. A Casio. So you say 18, shift. And then you go look for that button that has NCR on top. And you press okay. five and you press equal. And that should give you the answer for the NCR. That's the only thing you will need the calculator for. The rest of them, you can use your mental calculations in your head. <laughs> okay, thank you. Because you can see that this, they're not asking you to give one single answer. They're asking you to just simplify the formula, right? So mm -hmm. it means we need to just do each part separately. Okay. Oh. Oh. Hmm. Consider blah, blah, blah. Suppose that is the same question, but they have given us the new N and we still use the probability of success of 0, 0,8. The question here is calculate the standard deviation. You need to know what is the formula for calculating the standard deviation. So the standard deviation for binomial, it's given by the square root of n times pi times 1 minus the pi. So you just substitute and calculate. n 16 times your pi. 0, 0,8 times 1 minus 0, 0,8, which is equals to 1.6. If you are using a sharp calculator, you will have to do this step by step. So you can just say, uh, 16 times 28 times into bracket 1 minus 28, or you can just say times 0 0.2 because it's easy to calculate that, and you get the answer of 2.56. So the answer of 2.56. That is what we call the variance. This is the variance. It is sigma squared. That this answer, just this answer inside. Once you have that answer, then you just press the square root of the answer and it will give you the standard deviation, which is option B. On the case here, you have a fraction thingy or the thingy, you can use your, your square root and it will give you a blocky and then you just put the values and press equal. And that is the easiest calculator to use, especially when you're doing calculations like this. It saves you time. But So if the question was calculate the variance, you know that the variance is just the value underneath the square root. You remove the square root, it will give you the variance. Okay, moving on to the next question, question 11. We are now in Poisson, the same with binomial with Poisson. You need to know the, prob the properties of a Poisson. You need to know how to calculate the expected value, the standard deviation, the variance. More especially, you need to know how to calculate the probability. 
You can also use tables or you can use formulas. So consider a Poisson distribution with expected value or the expected occurrence per interval equals 10.5. Calculate the probability that the number of occurrence is exactly 9. So our x is equals to 9. So what they are asking you to calculate is the probability of, and this is Poisson. So we're going to start with e to the power of negative pi, uh, negative lambda. So our lambda is 10.5 times lambda to the power of x divide by x factorial. So e to the power of negative 10.50 times 10.50 to the power of x our x is Nine divided by nine factorial. So you might ask yourself, where is on the cashew? A factorial looks like that. On a sharp calculator, a factorial looks like that. So you will have to go and find where your factorial is at. On a casio E, because we have an E as well. On a casio, let me open my calculator quickly. On a casio, your E will have an E with a block. You must look for it. I think it's on top of lin, ln. You must look for it. It's written in orange on the sharp calculator. Your E is on top of lin as well. It is written as E, oh, come on, as E X. So here is when we are using formulas to calculate. Okay, so. Um, Twitter is finished, Twitter. Yeah, so because E, e is written in uh, orange, we're going to press the shift or second function. First, so we do the first part, second function E, and it is E, and you need to use the plus or minus button. Plus huh? or minus button, eh? not the negative, but okay. the plus or minus button, which is on the sharp calculator, it is the value there at the bottom. On a cashier, it is the minus. On the case here, you will also you have to use the value in the bracket of the minus there. That is the negative that we are looking for. So here we'll press negative 10.50. And I'm going to do equal because I'm calculating this first part. And I'm going to multiply the answer I get with 10.5. To the power, I need the power. So on, on this calculator, my mm. power is this x to the power of 9. And I must do equal because then it's multiplying what is at the top. And then I must divide everything that is at the top. Divide by 9. And my factorial, I need to find where my factorial is at. It's on button number four, it's written in orange, so it's nine pictorial, and I press equal, and the answer is 0, 0,1177, which is this. Can you see how complex is this? Easy. Those with the Casio calculator, use your fraction thingy, my Bob, to, so you will say, you will press the button of your fraction and then you will press the, the shift. You will press shift. And then you will press the E button. And then you will put in the E button, you will put the negative and then 
five inside there and then you go out with the arrows i wish i have my calculator open can i open my casio calculator quickly so i can yes, show yes. the others <laughs> it's complex doing it this way so Maybe, I have yeah. to, okay take two minutes go to the bathroom go drink water i'm gonna be with you just now 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 i need to switch off because then i need to stop sharing
Hello, Slizzy. How is Lizzie? Can you hear me? Oh, gosh. Okay. My bad. I had put on the, the mute and I've been explaining all these things to myself then because I was talking to myself. Okay. I apologize, but I hope you saw the steps. I can start again yes, to explain. Yes. Uh, to explain again because I was speaking to myself. So I'm saying you need to put the fraction button, then you need to press the shift and then press the lin and press the negative and then you press 10.5. You don't have to put a zero because 10.50 is the same as 10.5. And you use the left arrow so that the flicker can move from a five to the bottom next to the line. And you can press the multiplication or you can press the closed bracket, the open bracket and closed bracket at the end. But I'm going to use the multiplication 10.5. And we press the power, which is this button that will give us the power. And it's to the power of nine and you use your down arrow to go to the bottom, and then you need to press nine and shift, and your X factorial is on the X to the power of a negative, where you press the X factorial, and then you press equal. So you can see that this equation is the same as this equation that we have written, which is the same. Those who are using a sharp calculator, you also get the same question. The only trick here is for every step that you do for calculating the e to the power of a negative, you need to press the equal, press the multiplication button, and press the next button, the next step, and say equal. Always remember to press the equal sign. If you don't press the equal sign, what your equation will do will apply the Botmas rule when you are just continuing and punching in the values without pressing the equal sign. And it will not calculate correctly, especially if you don't use the brackets. So play, pay attention to how you work with your calculators, especially for the sharp calculators, because then the steps, you need to calculate them individually unless if you have the right calculator where it also creates a fraction calculators like this. Sorry, oh, Lizzie, can, can I ask you to... Yes? Sorry, can I ask you to just do the Cassia one more time, just go through the steps? I'm not getting it right on my computer, uh, on my calculator. On your Casio? Casio, yeah. Okay. Thank Let you. Start. Press the fraction button. Press the shift fraction. button. Yes, shift. Okay. And press the len where there is the e to the power of a box, right? You see that function is yes. press the button that has that function. Okay. Press the minus, not the not this min, not the negative button, not the minus, the subtraction, the negative with a minus inside uh, the bracket. Press that yeah. and then press 10.5 and go to your arrows and press the left, the right arrow, not left, the right arrow, which is this arrow here. Once you have pressed that button, then press the multiply, which is the multiplication, and then press 10.5. And once you have pressed 10.5, press the shift button, and then press the X with the power of a box. Actually, we, we didn't have to press the shift. Press the shift again. Mm -hmm. We need to take away the shift. Yeah. And then you press the box, the X with the box. 
and then press nine and then go down arrow and then press nine again and then go shift and press the x factorial where there is x to the power of negative one press that button it will create the next factorial and then press enter Okay, so. Okay, thank you. Yes. Alternatively, you can also use the table. So you need to go to Poison Tables. And remember, your Poison are, are split by probabilities, right? By the lambda values 0 0.1, 0 0.5. These are your poison tables. So let's see if they get to 10. If they don't get to 10, then you can use the poison tables. So they do get to 10, but they stop at 10, not 10.5. Hence, we had to use the, table, the, the formula. So in the exam, they won't give you questions like that anyway, where you can't use a table. Um, So you can see that this is just 10 is not 10.5. If it was 10.5, like we have with the rest of them, like 9.5 and 9, we would. And if you use just 10, you won't get the same answer as you would have. Okay, so. It, come, it gets to 10 and then it goes to 20. So you can use the table, but if if the values are like less than 10, you can use the table like one and from 0 0.1 up until uh, 10 and 20. You can use the table to get your probabilities. OK, so let's see. We only left with seven minutes. And we are on question 11. I don't know how many questions are in this. I think we will be almost, we are almost done. There are only two more questions. There were 13 questions. Okay, maybe we will be done with this. Now consider a Poisson distribution with the expected number of occurrences per interval being 0 0.43. So I will lambda now. It's easy to use. And they say at least. What does at least mean? This is where now you need to remember the not less than. It's at least less than or at least greater than, or is at least greater than or equal, or at least less than or equal. What is at least? At least less than equal. <laughs> No. Greater than equals three. It's greater than or equals to three. Oh, oh, Therefore, no. it means there are two ways you can do this. You can go to the poison table and add the probability of x is equals to three plus the probability of x is equals to four plus the probability no. of x is equals to five. <laughs> Plus up until you get to the end of the table, because if we go to the um, four point, what did it say? Four point three. That is our lambda. Four point three. Then it means we need to add all this up until fifteen. You can either do that, or you can say is the same as one minus the probability of x less than three, which means it's one minus the probability of x is equals to zero plus the probability of x 
is equals to one plus the probability of X is equals to two, which makes it easy for us to calculate. Instead of adding from three until 15, we can just add from zero until two and subtract from one. So let's say, So you need to have, come on, why is it going over now? You need to have your tables ready in the exams close by where you can use them. So the probability that we're going to add are only those three. So let's add them. We say it is one minus open bracket. 0 0.0136 plus 0 0.583 plus 0.1254 close bracket and equal and you press the SD change. The answer is 0 0.8027. So it means if you add all these values here, they will give you 0 0.8027. Let's go to our thingy, which is option A, is our answer. If you want to rely on formulas, you will need to calculate for each one of them using this formula, which will take you forever, right? Whereas you can just come here and use the probability already calculated, add them together and calculate. The only thing you need to always remember is the formula. What is at least? How do I calculate the shortcut of that at least, especially if the table is big? If the table is short, at least it's easy to calculate if there were only five. So it would have been three, four, and five that you are adding together. But because there are 15, so it's going to take you forever. So use the complement of, of the at least it's a less than. Okay. And that's how you will answer. That question in the next two minutes that concludes today's session. Let's see if we can answer the next question. Okay, so in terms of this one, they've given us the lambda, which a customer service representative notes that the service notes that since moving most of the service online, their average front desk traffic or front desk visit is currently 1.7 per person per hour. So we have our rate, which is our lambda of 1.7. So we go to our table and we look for 1.7. And we find 1.7, okay. Which one of the following statement is correct? We need to validate each one of them. So the probability that no one visits the front desk, it means the probability that X is equals to zero. What is that probability? So you go to the table and go and look for, don't, don't get trapped by that it's 0, 0, 0,00. No, go to the table to validate because the table is there with all the probabilities. So the probability of no one visiting is 0, 0,18527. So that is incorrect. The probability that at most, what is at most? What is at most? 
less than or equal to. It's less than or equal. So what is the probability that at most 17 people visit? Before you jump into conclusion, go to the table and check how many x values are there, right? So we go to the x to the table just to look at how many they are. So it says the probability that 17. Are they 17 there? No. There is no. Okay. So what will be that probability when there is none? 17 does not exist. Mm -hmm. So the answer is? Zero. Uh, so zero. Well, it mean, remember we're looking for the correct answer, right? So the answer here will be Probably that at most 17, but 17 doesn't exist. Um, it will be less than or equals to 17. So the sum of all of them will be equals to one. I'm going to come back to that one. Let's validate because it might be correct and, and it might not be correct. That is 17 does not exist on the table. But it says at most. So what is the standard mm -hmm. deviation of the uh, front desk. So the standard deviation. So what we know is this is the expected value. And it is also called the mean. Mm -hmm. And it is also called the variance. So if if the lambda is also called the variance. Then what is the standard deviation? The standard One, deviation two, will be the square root of the variance, right? Yeah. So the square root of the variance is 1.7 is 1.3. So therefore, mm -hmm. C is incorrect. We're looking for the correct answer. Number D, the probability that only one person so this they are asking you to find the probability that x is equals to one. Only mm -hmm. one person visit the front desk at any given point. So we go to the table and we look for probability of one. And that is 0, 0,3106. And 0, 0,3 Zero six, which this one says is zero comma three two three zero, which is incorrect. The probability that two persons visit. So we're looking for the probability that x is equals to two. So where x is equals to two, the answer is zero point two six. Sorry. To erase is zero comma two six four zero zero comma two six four zero so that is incorrect so the catch with the second one which is b is that they say the probability that at most 17 but we know that 17 is not part of this but at most means adding all of them. So even if 17 is not there, at most 17, it means we will, it would have been zero for 17 for some reason, like we have zeros on this ones. So let's assume that from not, from 10 until 17, it would have been zero, 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 because they don't have, they don't exist. They are mutually exclusive. So if we add at most, which is less than or equal. So zero, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero until we get to 10 
And then when we get to nine, we add one, 0 0.001, 0 0.003, all of them. The sum of all of them will be equals to one. Therefore, it makes number B the correct answer. That's the only way I can in, I can validate that one question. Yeah. And on that note, that concludes today's session. We have all the notes. If you still don't uh, have access to the WhatsApp groups, there is the link to the WhatsApp group. Otherwise, thank you for coming. After a while, and when we thank you. And for participating. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. See you on Sunday. Bye. Yeah. Okay, Sunday we're doing uh, study unit six and seven. Okay. Remember that. So you need to go and read all about. Chapter six and chapter or oh, sorry, study unit six and study unit seven. That's when we do that revision. Okay. okay. See you at three o'clock on Sunday, and uh, I might I might also ask for for you to excuse me on Sunday as well because Sunday is my birthday. Oh. I totally forgot about it, but uh, happy belated happy birthday in advance. <laughs> but we can talk on WhatsApp anyway. Uh, oh, I didn't stop the recording. Wait, sorry. <laughs>